Amen. Good evening. All right. Now, I'm just going to warn you. We're going to do some things a little differently tonight. What I mean by that is I'm going to try something I've never done before. And so we've tried it a little bit before we got started here. And when we get to that point in the message, just bear with us if it doesn't work too well. Amen? <laughs> so it's great to be with you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to play a video clip for you tonight from a good friend of mine named Dr. Robert Carter. Examining your worldview. We've been looking at all different facets of that. Maybe you came into church on Sunday and you had never really thought about the real history of the world. You hadn't thought about creation. You hadn't even thought about really that's just a real event that happened in the history of the world that affects you and me today. Maybe you didn't think about corruption. You knew it was a real event that happened in the history of the world and it affects you and me today. Sometimes we don't think too much about catastrophe, the flood, but it's a real event that happened in the history of the world and it affects you and me today. Then there was confusion. God brought languages in the world. It's a real event that happened in the history of the world. It affects you and me today. Then there's Christ and the cross. And I know you've heard many teachings about that. And they are real events that happened in the history of the world. And they affect you and me today and for eternity as well. And then there's a future consummation. What a glorious time that's going to be. But right now, we're not there. We're still here. Amen? And so tonight, we're going to look at our worldview. And I want to remind you what we said earlier in the week about John chapter 3, verse 12, where Nicodemus was told by Jesus, Jesus said to him, If I've told you of earthly things and you believe not, then how shall you believe when I teach you and tell you of the heavenly things? And then 1 Corinthians 2, 14, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness under him, neither can he know them. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. And so we live in a world that has both people who know the Lord and people who don't know the Lord. And those people who don't know the Lord, some of them, quite frankly, really don't like our ideas that we have about the Lord, and they don't like his word. They don't want to be around God's word. They want to look at their world through the lens of their own eyes, and they want to determine truth for themselves. And so starting off tonight, I thought I would give you a test. Amen? How many of you like tests? Oh, there's a few hands up. Amen. Yeah. All right. We'll have you come forward for lying later on. Amen? And so, <laughs> so we look at our world. Perception. Perception. How do you see things? Amen? You ready? Here we go. I'm going to count silently to ten. And then I'm going to give you the answer. If you get the answer, raise your hand. Ready? <coughs> ten. There's only about five or seven hands up in each area. Can you find the, the mistake? Oh, you tricked me. Oh, no. You've actually been trained a certain way to read. Your eyes work a certain way. They have developed pattern and pattern making in how you perceive things. Isn't that fun? How about this one? This one's really good. Well, are there four or are there three? Four. Three. <laughs> well, there's both. What? Yeah, oh, your mind's really going crazy now. This is very clever graphics. Yes, three, four, three, four. It's confusing. This next one is very famous, okay? And so when I put it up there, I will ask you two questions, and I just want you to raise your hand for each one, and then we will show you the difference. Ready? How many of you see an old woman? Raise your hand, okay? How many of you see a young woman? How many of you see both women? Yeah, there's two women in here. The young lady has, this is the tip of her nose. She's got her head turned like this, and she's looking that way. That's her ear, okay, and that's her hair. The old woman, this is the chin of the old woman here. That's her mouth. This is the tip of her nose. That's her left eye, and she's looking over here. Perception. 
Perception, how you view things in the world. Imagine if you were driving down the road and you glanced over and you saw that. Well, that's just a mural on the side of a building. There's not columns in that building at all. There's no hole in the building. How about this one? Yeah, look at that big hole in the building. No, well, not really. That's in Los Gatos, California. That's just a very, very good artist. This one is really difficult because you don't know where it starts. Amen? And actually where it starts is just the brick over here and over here. All the rest is a mural. Wow. Perception. How you see things. Here's a, here's a cow and a guy up on a scaffold and all of that is a mural. That was in uh, 29 Palms, California on Valentine's Day. Maybe you'd go buy a truck someday and you'd see that, right? That would make you look twice, huh? How could that happen? Maybe you're walking down the road. I've got a couple of friends I've met since I worked at the Creation Museum. And uh, Julian Beaver uh, uh, is uh, one of them. And he does these chalk drawings. And when you get at a certain perspective, it's amazing what you see. The little kid is sitting on the, ch on the sidewalk, but he drew all that around it. Here's another one that's kind of fun. That's Julian in the background there. When you're walking in this direction, it looks like a big hole. Nope, don't want to step in the hole. How about that hole? Yeah, that's amazing. Some of them are multi-directional that he does. You know, here's a, he's got a mask on there. He's just having fun, okay? But, um, but this one's my favorite. This is in an elevator. Could you imagine going into an elevator and you don't see a floor? Okay? And a, and a young man like that is standing like this, and he goes, ah, 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 and then he jumps off, and then he lands on the floor. And you think he's going all the way down to the bottom of the shaft. So, perception. What is your worldview? And you see, that's what we've been dealing with. I've been trying to help you recognize that we see things in the physical world. And then we're taught information about those things in the physical world. And if we don't have enough information, we can be led in the total opposite direction from the real truth of what we see in our world. And so we have to pay attention. We have to learn how to be discerning. And as a Christian, it starts in understanding the authority of the Word of God and the place that it needs to have in my life. And when I have the Word of God, when I'm in the Word of God, when the Spirit of God, through His Word, starts building up as a reservoir in me, I can begin really to discern things that are in the world that I never would have seen had I just started out on my journey. Amen? And so we need to recognize that in the area of biology. Why do you so strong on that, preacher? Well, I'll tell you why. Smiley over here, dinosaurs have been used for years to take people away from the authority of the Word of God. One of the other ones that's been used for years is biology. You and me, we grow up, we get hurt. What do we do? We go to the doctor. And when we go to the doctor, we are trying to find a godly man or woman of character that are going to take the needs that we have, analyze what's going on, and give us help. But what we don't know is how have they been trained. We have no idea. We put our faith in their hands. You came in tonight. You walked into church, you sat down in that pew, you didn't think for one second it wouldn't hold you up, right? You put total faith in sitting down. And in many areas of our life, you'd be amazed at how much faith we're putting in things that we've never really thought through. And I'm going to show you tonight, there's one area of biology that has been a stumbling block to human beings for years. And it's been used to promote the idea that God is not real. And you cannot trust his word because evolution has proven millions of years ago that something happened in biology. So that's why we're going to look at it. And we're going to look at this basic question and idea. Why do things change in biology? So we understand that history, the biblical history that we have of the world that we live in, seven major events in the history of the world. 
We know that God created. We know that it's a real event that happened in the history of the world. It affects you and me today. But do you realize we all have the same facts? We all understand what God did. And as we look at our world, we all look at the same blueberries. We all look at the same oranges. We all look at the same rocks. We all look at the same water. We use the same microscopes. We have access to the same testing procedures. And yet, we will get two totally opposing worldviews. And yet, we all have the same thing. And that's what's happened in this area of biology. We even have what you might say the same science. We use biology, chemistry, physics. It's our starting point that matters. It's what's in our head when we begin to look at the evidence that we see in the world today. I had been preaching at the Creation Museum for 10 years. And when I was there, uh, I learned a ton about the world that we live in. Then I went to Creation Ministries International. And when I got to Creation Ministries International, there was a film that was produced, and a copy of it is back there on the table, called The Voyage That Shook the World. And this film is all about the voyage of Charles Darwin. Why did he begin to believe what he believed and what happened when he went on his voyage with the Beagle and the Galapagos Islands? But in this film, I was able to be introduced to a, uh, a man named Matty Lasola. That's Dr. Lasola right there. And I want you to listen to him. He's one of the mo most uh, uh, gifted men uh, in the world when it comes to biochemistry. And he talks about the real world that we live in. He says, modern biology is information science. And as far as we know, information always has an intelligent source. So when we look at biology, we're looking at an automatic question. Where did that information come from? Because all of biology, as you're going to see tonight, develops because of the information it has to produce and reproduce itself. And so... We have a genome inside our bodies. A genome is an organism's complete set of genetic instructions. Each genome contains all the information that's needed to build that organism and allow it to grow and develop. So everything in biology, plants, mammals, everything that's a biological creature has a genome. Well, what is that genome? Well, quite frankly, it's a blueprint. It's a set of instructions. But it's interesting. If you owned a set of instructions for a beautiful home, would you have a beautiful home? No, because all you have is what? A set of instructions. What do you need? You need capital, amen? <laughs> you need a builder. You need a piece of land. And now when you've got the place to build it, the people to build it, the materials to build it, and now you have a plan, now you've got to have somebody who can read the plan and make it all happen. All of that is in your genome. And we're going to look at it in detail. DNA is that building block that's inside every cell. It's the instructions of our genome. DNA is a twisted structure. It's in a, what they call the shape of a double helix. It goes, it wraps itself around itself. It's the most complex information storage mechanism in the known universe. And it's in every single cell that you have. And it's actually rather large. Uh, the DNA itself, single strands of DNA, they're coiled up into structures that are called chromosomes. Your chromosomes are located in the nucleus in every cell in your body. If I had little tiny tweezers and I could reach in there and grab that structure, and if I were to straighten it out, it could be five to seven feet long. And it's in every cell in your body. And it's in every cell of every living thing in the known universe. And so in our cells, our cells are absolutely amazing. And inside the cell, inside the nucleus of the cell, that's where we find this information. And the question is, where did all this information come from? Remember, evolution says what happens over long periods of time, inorganic material became organic. And then this information developed over time. Well, those chromosomes, each cell contains DNA, and it's packed into these units called chromosomes. It's basically a long chain of genetic material. 
And within our chromosomes, the sections of the DNA, they're read together. They communicate to each other, and they make what are called genes. And so those genes control different characteristics. And what makes you you? Maybe your height, maybe your width. Maybe your nose, your eye, your hair, all those kind of things are controlled by the information that's inside the cell. Genes are coded instructions that tell cells how to make proteins. And proteins are the building blocks of all living things. Genes can be short in number or they can be massive in the base pairs that they have. Bill Gates said the gene is by far the most sophisticated program around. Dr. Carter. The human genome is the most complex computer operating system anywhere in the known universe. It controls a super complex biochemistry that acts with single molecular precision. It controls the interaction network of hundreds of thousands of proteins. Are you getting the picture yet? You starting to understand how complex one nucleus of a cell is? Dr. Carter works with another man, Dr. John Sanford. He's a believer. Dr. Sanford is the one who has invented what's called the gene gun. It's the very thing that reads the DNA. And he and Dr. Carter, they work together and they continue to analyze and understand what's going on in the genetic makeup of our world. It's a wonderful testament to the creative brilliance of God and an excellent example of the scientific bankruptcy of neo-Darwinian theory. Why? Because the more complex life is, the less tenable evolutionary theory becomes. Now, I tried real hard to get a video here, and I'm going to show you a clip from it now, hopefully. And this is Dr. Carter. He's in the film, and it's called Is Genesis History? And I want you to listen as he has a discussion with the host. The host has a big background in computers. And they're talking about this information, this DNA. And they're going to discuss for three minutes elements of it. And I want you to catch how complicated DNA is. And think in the back of your mind, how could evolution ever produce what they are going to talk about. So we're going to give it a roll here. So what you're saying when we look at this from a, um, a molecular or genetic perspective, uh, what we're finding is really a fascinating design in all of that. Absolutely. But what we've heard in the conventional paradigm, the conventional story tells us that it's those random changes that has brought about all of this. Sure. Back in the 1800s, when life was simple, mm -hmm. when they didn't know what was happening inside the cell, they didn't know how complex genetics was, you could imagine all sorts of things. But now that we know what actually happens behind the scenes, mm -hmm. the story gets a lot more complicated. You see, I like to say that the genome is four-dimensional. Mm. Well, we have a one-dimensional string called DNA. And if you want to draw that out, you have to write all the letters of DNA out on all three billion of them. And then you have to draw lines or arrows from one part to another part because this part turns this part off, this part interferes with this, this part enhances this. It's this huge two-dimensional interaction network. And that's why you have a two-dimensional genome. Hey, I mean, let me stop here all for right. a second because this is really amazing to think about this because um, I think in terms of a computer program that it's fairly static. I mean, yeah. the instructions are there, but you're talking about a program that is reprogramming itself. Oh, it's modifying its own instructions. Oh, wait till I get to the fourth dimension. Oh, okay. Because of the third dimension first. The information in that first dimension, that linear string, has to be organized in such a way that when it falls into the third dimension, it still works. Oh, that's amazing. Genes that are used together are next to each other in 3D space. Oh, okay. Are you saying that once this thing gets folded up, it's almost like we have a new set of instructions? Yes, a new level of information. Unbelievable. That whoever programmed that first level needed to understand what was going to happen, have a work in the third level. But you said there's another dimension. Here. Oh, yeah. The fourth dimension is time. And how does that work? The genome changes shape over time. Maybe you eat something that's bad for you, and your liver says, I can get rid of that toxin. Now, the chromosomes in the liver will change shape, expose that new protein gene, make copies of it, 
build a brand new protein that can kill off that toxin, and when it's not needed anymore, they'll change shape again and fall back. Oh my goodness. Dynamic programming. All three levels change in the fourth level time. Rob, that's so far beyond anything that we know, even in our most complex software systems, that it, it's almost beyond imagination to think that someone would look at that and say it all happened by chance. Yes, and it only brings glory to God. It does. You can't build something like that up one thing at a time. You need it to function. And, and all this interlocking four-dimensional complexity is not something you can do one letter at a time with natural selection. And that's in every cell in your body. Biology is one of the strongest arguments against molecules to man evolution for that very reason. Isn't that fascinating? That in my body, my body has the ability, the ability to respond dynamically and all the information it needs to be able to respond dynamically to something foreign is already in there. Evolution says things changes over long periods of time. That's impossible. And what we see when we look in our world is exactly what we read where? Right here. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And you are. And you should rejoice in that truth because it's another example of the love of God and what he's done. I have no idea where I was before November 19th, 1961. But then I was born and he allowed me to have this body and he gave me all this information so that I could come to know him. Wow. That's why we call him God. Amen? He is the Lord. And he is magnificent. And as we look at the creation, and we're just beginning in biology, amen? We're only in through the introduction here. We got 470 more slides. I'm kidding. <laughs> He's marvelous. And so often we let the, the controls of our lives get in the way of recognizing the magnitude of what we have. And many of you parents know exactly what this is like because you have children and the enormity of the complexity of what's happening right in front of you becomes reality. And God whispers in your ear and says, hey, I love you and I love your child too. Amen. And so we continue. The genome. The human genome is made up of 3.2 billion, billion base pairs of DNA, but other organisms have different genome sizes. If we printed out the letters in your genome, it would be more than a thousand books. If we took the, the DNA and it would fill 200, 500 page telephone directories. This is in every one of your cells. It would take a century to recite if recited one letter per second for 24 hours a day. The information that's coded in your genome. If, if it, it was printed out at one millimeter apart, the DNA letters in your genome would extend 3,000 kilometers. That would be the distance from New York to Manas or from London to the Canary Islands. And that's in every cell in your body. Wow. And the DNA, the chromosomes, depending upon how it's configured, makes up different things in life. For instance, the dogs there, they have 78 pairs of chromosomes. The mosquito has got six. The chicken has 78. The tomato, 24. The mouse, 40. The human, 46. Humans have 24 different chromosomes, 22 pairs of autosomes, and two sex chromosomes. And so the, the understanding I want you to get is this. Information specifies living things. If the DNA for a single cell amoeba is really small, but DNA for a horse would be a lot. And so you see, for molecules to man evolution to work, you need new information added into the DNA code. Why? Because you've got to change something into something else. Right? 
because we know absolutely that plant, me, all things that are living have this code in them. So evolution from molecules to man, uh, uh, natural evolution, information arose out of nothing. It talks about having constant random changes, increasing information over long periods of time. And that's what I've shown you. I've shown you glimpses of this this week. We looked at dinosaurs and the dinosaur message. How in the museums they're saying dinosaurs went extinct. No, birds are essentially modern short-tailed feathered dinosaurs. Really? How does that happen? Here's the Field Museum in Chicago. Birds are dinosaurs. They're trying to teach the general public the wrong information about biology. And it's not that they don't know the biology, they do. They lie on purpose. Because this, what we just showed you, is known by everyone in the DNA community. There's no doubt about it, absolutely. I showed you that slide about this one, cow to whale evolution. How do you get a cow to turn into a whale? You'd have to change what? His DNA. We got a lot of DNA to look at on the planet. I had mentioned my relative who went to the Grand Rapids Museum there, and you, here's what she wrote on Facebook. I learned that whales began as land animals. And they promote this stuff in the textbooks. You know, they show you different supposedly transitional fossils. They don't have any of them. They're called missing links. We talked about that yesterday. And so, you know, they have the above image shows evolution of whales. Oh, they started here and he ended up like this. But then I also showed you another fact, right? I showed you that, hey, if we understand erosion, we know that the, all, the, all the earth would be in the ocean in no more than 14 million years. Another evidence that evolution has a big problem. Why? Because the science doesn't match their worldview. Not at all. But the worldview we get from the word of God, what I find in my world, agrees with what I read in God's word. And so this whole idea of a chart like this, whenever you see millions of years up here, that's a red flag. You say, well, I'm not going to be being told the truth. Back to biology, Dr. Lasola. When I hear the word evolution, it has many meanings. We have to define it, define the word. And in this context, we're talking about evolution turning molecules to man. And in, the grand, and in this grand scale, I don't see any evidence, really. Now we're talking about DNA. Enzymes are informational molecules. They're actually the tools that nature uses to modify things. So it's totally inconceivable that an informational molecule could be created by random mechanism. When we introduce randomness, the informational content disappears. The enzymes are degraded. They are non-functional. Darwin had no idea, of course, what the cell looked like, what the information system is like, what the complexity of the cell is. It seems that nature is resisting change. Notice what he says here. Living cells resist change. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, in the early days of genetic engineering, people were envisioning changing organisms at will. It hasn't happened. The examples are minor. We can produce insulin with bacteria. We can produce an EPO hormone with bacteria, but we can't change bacteria into anything else but what? Bacteria. How about that? Dr. Lee Spetner is also another expert in his book, Not By Chance. He's talking about mutations. All point mutations that have been studied on a molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information in the genome and not increase it. You see, in order for something to change, it has to have an increase in the information. You've got to change that ear to a fin, you know, or whatever, to have, you know, a land animal become a fish. You know how much change that would take? Massive amounts. Not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. What's biology saying? The likelihood of life having occurred through a chemical accident is, for all intents and purposes, zero. I sat in a very flimsy building in the Philippines on a rickety chair with a young man who was going to school at a college there learning biology. And I wasn't scheduled to preach on biology, but I took this message and I sat down and I showed him this information. 
And he looked at me and he said, I have never heard anything like this in my life. They have said nothing about any of this in any of the biology courses that I've had at university. People become willingly ignorant when they have a worldview they want to hold on to. And yet the information is crystal clear. This idea of macroevolution, one thing changing into another, that's impossible. But do we see change? Yes, we do. And that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the evening. Here's Dr. John Sanford. I mentioned him earlier. And so in genetic entropy, he teaches about the degradation of the information in DNA over time. He says bad mutations are passed on to the next generation of every living organism. The mutation rate increases every time a cell reproduces itself. So let me give you an example. We're going to use you as the example. Do you know that you have a hundred trillion cells in your body? Wow. Hundred trillion. Do you know that every minute you generate well over one, excuse me, every second, you generate over a million new cells? So, this will gross out some of you. So when you go like this, what's happening? Dead cells going to the bottom. Where do you think all these great CSI themes come from? They find what? DNA evidence at the scene of the crime. Why? Because humans are leaving DNA all over the place. We lose hair, we lose skin cells. Our bodies are constantly changing. About 90 days is the max for most cells in your body. They get replaced. What did Dr. Sanford talk about? That every time a new generation of cells come in, a small amount of mutation happens. You want to know why you're going to get old and die? That's why. Because when one generation replaces the previous generation, it loses a little bit more of information. That's what's happening. That's why your skin loses its flexibility. That's why your hair turns a different color. That All sorts of things. It's because of natural biology in action. And by the way, God said what? Hey, Adam, dying you will die. You'll begin to die and continue to die until you're dead, right? That's what we do. Consider this. Why did God kick Adam out of the Garden of Eden? Because there was a tree called a tree of life. And if he had access to it, his biology would be affected by it. And he would live. Isn't it interesting that in consummation in the future, we're going to have access to a tree of life that the Bible says has 10 different fruits. Why? Because God is going to raise up our bodies, those of us who put our faith and trust in him, and we're going to have a new body. And it'll be awesome. Believe that? Hey, man, I'm excited about that, brother. You should be too. No more aches, no more pains, no more diabetes for me. Yeah, that's coming. But biology, biology started in the Garden of Eden, continues today, will continue into the new heavens and the new earth. You generate over a million new cells a second. So since I've been talking to you, you've already had over 120 million new cells come online. Man. Some of you are saying, I wish I had a penny for every new cell that was generated. Yeah, I hear you. We're amazing. God said in the beginning he created everything. And in six days, but biology on day three, on day five, and day six, we've gone through this. He created what? Everything according to their kinds. We read about it there. After his kind, after their kind. Genetic information God has allowed us to look into our biology in our world and we understand that information we call DNA fascinating it's what we would expect to find I want to talk to you about these kinds biological kinds of living creatures that can produce offspring regardless of how they look because like will begat like within the kind I've talked to many evolutionists and I said to him, excuse me, yes, could you just give me an example of one kind of animal that has changed into another that you've seen with empirical science today? 
What's the answer? There are none. If evolution were true, how come I don't see a 30% human ape? How, do, how come I don't see a 60% human ape? How come I don't see any other kinds changing into something else? Where's the cow that's halfway on his way to a whale? I don't see it. What's their answer? Oh, we just need more time. No, we don't. We don't need any more time because we have biology that tells us we don't see a change in the information at all. Why? Because every generation is a mutation. It's not added information. And when the mutation happens, it's going, as I'm going to show you, it changes the way a kind can look and appear, but it doesn't change one kind into another kind. See the difference? So why do things change? Well, how long does it take for see changes within a kind? Guess what? It doesn't take millions of years to see changes within a kind. It just takes what? In the right conditions. When you leave today, as you leave the three main aisles, there's two tracks and piles. Feel free to take one or two. Because now I'm going to go through these two things to show you how it works. Well, do animals change? The origin of the domestic dog from wolves has been established. By the way, this is written by non-believers. We examine the mitochondrial DNA sequence variation among 654 dogs, representing all the major dog populations in the world, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. Well, the Word of God tells me about that. Amen? It says, in the beginning, what happened? God created. So, a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. So, the genetic information in the dog, there's all sorts of variations that can happen depending upon what information from mom and dad go into the next generation. Well, do dogs change? Yes, they do. Into what? Different kinds of dogs. They don't become cats. Amen? Dogs don't become chickens. Amen? They don't. So let's look at our biblical worldview. We put on the lens of scripture. We have creation. God created the canine kind. So we have canines. What do they do? They have puppies, right? Oh, we got to go. Th here we go. They have puppies. And then what do they have? Well, they have puppies. And then they have puppies. And then they have puppies. And then they have puppies and puppies. And puppies and puppies and puppies. And puppies, and puppies, and puppies and woo! Lots of dogs in the pre-flood world, right? Then sin came into the world, right? And then God's going to judge the world with a worldwide flood. What does he do? He goes into the whole dog population, and then he brings two of every sort. Genesis 6, 19, thou shalt bring into the ark, keep them alive, male and female, the fowls after their kind, cattle after their kind, creeping thing after their kind, two of every sort. And so in the ark go two of the canine kind. And they hang out on the ark for a year, and then they get out. Maybe before they got out, they had puppies. We don't know. But they had puppies. Who had puppies? 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 Who had pu Woo! Lots and lots of dogs, right? Lots of dogs. All over the world. And genetic information begins to change. But does it change from added information? No. It changes from the pool of information that was already present in the first two dogs that got off the ark, and now the mutation rates are going to begin. We'll see changes, all right, but what do they change into? Other kinds of dogs. And that's why we have all of this variation within the kind today. But they're all still what? Canines. You may not realize foxes are part of the canine world. Maybe you don't realize wolves are a part of that. All of these animals, if they wanted to, could interbreed with each other. The dingo and the sand fox and all sorts of dogs. Dogs everywhere, the canine kind. There's a variation within the dog kind, but the change didn't come from increased information. It came from a decrease in the information. And so then we have these mutations, right? Mutations happen from one generation to the next most changes from one generation to the next is caused by mutation not by added information into the genome of the dog so we start out with something that maybe looks like a wolf right and then they have puppies and then it starts to mutate it looks like a coyote and then it mutates a little more maybe a dingo and then mutates a little more and then maybe a collie and then you end up with a biological disaster like a chihuahua right <laughs> Because that's what it is. It's lost all this information. Okay? 
but they change. But again, it's within the kind. And when I take my glasses and look at my world today, I can see changes within a kind. Here's a wolfen. False killer whale and a bottlenose dolphin breed. Here's a Zedong. We put these outside the Creation Museum. You'll see them at the Ark Encounter. You'll see a bunch of animals in these categories there. Here's a Pisley, a polar bear and a grizzly. They're the same kind. They sure look different. Oh, evolutionists like to say, oh, it's a new species, new this, new that. Mm, it's not a new kind. It's something within a kind. Yes, it's a change. Here's the liger, a lion and a tiger breed. Look at that. Fascinating. Again, some more pups. Different breeds mixed together. This is Gibson, the world's largest dog in 2004, and Boo Boo, the world's smallest dog in 2007. I'd say that's a loss of genetic information right there. Yeah. But they're still what? Dogs. Still dogs. Here's a Clydesdale and a miniature horse. And so we look at this change in biology. Dr. Lasol, again, I think that nature has been created to be able to modify itself and fitting the circumstances where living organisms are. We see a lot of variation potential in nature, but real novelties, that means new information, are not there. People talk about different species and speciation in nature. That's something we can observe. That's what we just looked at. But it's not the same thing as creating new structures, new information. I don't see that. Okay? So things change within a kind because it takes the right conditions. And the right conditions is they mate and they pass their genetic information off to the next generation. Now let's look what happens. We'll, we'll stay with dogs and we'll look at something Darwin called natural selection. Natural selection is the process in nature by which, according to Darwin's theory of evolution, only the organisms best adapted to their environment tend to survive and transmit their genetic characteristics in increasing numbers to succeeding generations while those less adapted tend to be eliminated. Guess what? I agree with what Darwin is saying. Why? Because that's what we observe in the real world today. Let me show you how it works. Here's our dogs again, right? We're going to look at the dog fur. One piece of genetic information. The length of fur, okay? So there'll be one piece and one little chromosome in their whole DNA. Maybe they have an L and an S. So mom and dad have a long and a short, right? They have puppies. They will pass one piece of information, one from mom, one from dad, into the pups. So there's four possible choices that could happen. It could be S and S, which would be what? Short fur. He could get an L from dad, S from mom, S from dad, L from mom, medium fur. Or they could get L and L, and they would have what? Long fur. So the puppies breed, and they have long fur dogs. And so what happened to the information for short fur? It's gone. And it'll never come back. Why? Because it's been lost because it has mutated out. You see that? We've heard terms in our life about switching on genes and switching off genes and turning on information and turning off information. That's what this is talking about. It's talking about what happens through mutation. The result is a loss of genes for short and medium length fur because you need L and S to have medium. So the only thing that that pup, if it mates another pup that has LL can have is a dog with long fur. This is how breeders breed horses, dogs, all sorts of things. They see characteristics they like, they breed them together in a hope that the offspring will maintain that predominant characteristic. And so they started out with medium fur, they ended up with a pup with long fur, the result is a loss of information. Now follow me here. Now we're gonna take that natural selection and we're gonna put adaptation in it and we're gonna bring this whole thing to a close. So the dogs get out of the ark, right? And they're on the earth. And they can go all over the earth. There's plenty of time. So that means those dogs are going to be exposed to different climates. 
What about the dogs that go north, right? Talking about adaptation. You have two original dogs, okay? And so they decide to go north, and they have long fur. What's going to happen to that dog? He's going to survive, right? Any of those dogs that went north to the Arctic that have short fur, what's going to happen to them? They're going to die. Why? They can't stay warm. So in a short period of time, the only dogs you're going to find in the Arctic are dogs with long fur fur. That's adaptation and natural selection happening at the same time. Okay? And so, the ones that went north, you're only going to have long, thick fur genes. Those are the ones that are going to survive. What if we go the other way? What if we go down towards the equator? Will a long fur dog survive in the equator? No. He's going to die. He overheats. Who's going to survive? Short fur dogs. So when they have puppies, the ones that are going to survive are going to be the ones that have the S information. And any dog with the L information, he's going to die out. And over a short period of time, what do you have? Short-haired dogs. Where? All in the hot regions. I talked about this a lot when I was in the Philippines talking to the kids. You know why? That country has more stray dogs anywhere I've ever been in my whole life. They are everywhere. I'll show you one. Here he is. Yes, even when you eat, they're all around. You can be on the second floor of a building. They'll find you if you're eating, okay? But notice the dog. All the stray dogs look like this one. Does he have long fur? No. Why? That characteristic has mutated out in the whole population of all the dogs I saw. The only long fur dogs that I saw were ones that owners had brought in from other countries, and they were walking them on a leash. You see, that's natural selection and adaptation. That's how it happens in an example of a dog. Let me show you another one. In such a way, creatures can become better suited to the environment in which they find themselves. And so say we have a population of plants, trees, that are in a grove. And so here they are. And so we've got four characteristics again. A tree with long roots, a tree with short roots, a tree with medium roots. But then it becomes a very dry season, right? So what happens to the water table? It goes down. What happens to the tree with short roots? It dies. Can't get any water. It can't produce any nuts to reproduce after itself in that area anymore. What about the tree with medium roots? Same thing. It dies. Now no more roots are gonna, new, uh, uh, seeds are going to go out with information for medium length roots. The only roots that are going to go down to get water are the long information roots. And then all of a sudden, the only trees you find growing in that area are trees with long roots. How about that? This is why we see change in biology in the world that we live in. Because there is natural selection and there is adaptation. But it's also linked with the genetic information of the biology living in that region. That's why we find change. That's why we find variety. But we don't find it because there's any new information. That we don't see at all in any of the biology. So now let's talk about one more kind. Do humans change? I want to show you the biblical answer to racism. This small section, I just want to tell you before we walk into this. I was asked to preach in Ashburn, Georgia at a public school. 675 kids at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And they wanted me to preach a message on the biblical answer to racism. And understanding that question comes right here in the section of this message. And I had the wonderful opportunity to preach what I'm about to teach you to those kids. And at one point in here, I'm going to share with you something that happened. And so, big changes in people? Do you see changes in people? Absolutely. Do you see a difference in the way you looked and what your grandfather looked? Yep. Your grandmother? Yep. Do you see changes in your kid? Yep. Is it new information? Nope. Not at all. The biology works the same. And the Lord God formed man in the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He is unique. 
He is here because God created everything for the opportunity to have a relationship with mankind. And so the biological fact is that all human beings belong to one race. It's called the human race. This whole idea of racism comes straight out of the pits of hell. It doesn't come from the word of God. Because the Bible's crystal clear. We're human beings. Whether you're short, fat, tall, skinny, red, black, blue, green, yellow, white, it doesn't matter. We look at your DNA, you're a human being. And God died for your sin just like every other human being you're going to run into in your whole life. And so... The history of the world? Yes, there's a creation. He creates Adam and Eve. Then there's what? Sin comes into the world. It affects everything. Adam and Eve go out and have sons and daughters. The population of the world increases. Then there's a bottleneck at Noah. So now Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives get on the ark. They come out of the ark and they have children and we are related to them. We can look at that interesting DNA Dr. Carter has shown me, and we can take your blood sample, and we can look at the mitochondrial DNA, and we can actually show you markers that don't change over time, and we could actually show you A, B, or C, which of the three wives to the sons of Noah you're related to. If evolution were true, you wouldn't see any of that. But the Bible tells us what happened in time and what we find in our world agrees with what we see in God's word. But they were there and they weren't spreading out. But they all had one genome that came from Noah, right? And his sons and their wives. And so what happened? God brought languages into existence. So this common gene pool is going to be divided because of the language barriers. So what's going to happen? Now the mutation rate is going to increase... Because there's a smaller amount of people than there were, and there's going to be changes happening in these people who now speak different languages. Tip for all you who aren't married yet. You should marry somebody you can talk to, amen? <laughs> so when languages came into existence, did uh, this person over here marry that one over there? Not likely. Those who spoke the same language took off went in the direction that they were going to go. Some went east, and we know them as, you know, uh, in, the, in the European sector, or west, rather. Some went east, and we know them as Asian. Some went south. They went out and across the face of the world. Why, that's why God wanted them to get going. And so he brought languages into existence, and people filled the earth just like the dog kinds. And the biology works the same. And so there's mutations that begin happening, and people start having different things happening to their body based upon the information that they get from mom and dad. The DNA variation in humans, you are 99.8% similar to every other human being on the planet. 99.8. That's right. That's why maybe we could take your heart and give it to somebody else. We can take a blood transfusion from you and use it in somebody else. The commonality between human beings is amazing. There's only a 0.2% variation, and that variation of 0.2% is 85% between the linguistic groups, 9% between a local ethnic group, and 6% between tribes. And yet we live in our world today and we see, we see the public media trying to crucify people because of how they look or what color they are, right? Yeah, happens all the time. Well, how does our skin get its color? Well, I'm going to show you. We go back to that genetic information, right? It comes from the chromosomes. And those chromosomes, they give us genes. And genes working together and individually produce proteins. And there's four main genes working with other genes that influence skin color. We all have the same genes, but each person's color factories are not as efficient in their production as somebody else's. So, we're all actually a shade of brown. Did you know that? Some of us are very dark brown and some of us are very light brown. I remember I was preaching this message in Atlanta in another venue and I was starting to go through this and I, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier and I went like this. I said, look, 
You called me a white man earlier. I said, this is a white shirt. Am I a white man? No. This guy in the back, he was great. He burst out laughing. He goes, woohoo! Brother Tilton thinks he's a black man, you know, and they're all laughing, you know. But those people were so relieved when I got done. Why? Because we continued. We talked about the melanin and how is it produced. And based upon the genetic information that you got from mom and dad, and based upon the efficiency of the factories that are in your skin, that's what gives you the skin tone. You're not any different from somebody else because you're darker or lighter. No. You're 99.2%. 99.8% the same as every other human being. The difference is, is what happens in the genetic makeup that you get from mom and dad. And then we have some people who are light-faired skinned, you know, and they can go out and they sit in the sun, right? What happens to them? Do they burn like a piece of toast? No. The efficiency of their factories becomes increased and they start producing more melanin and they get a tan. Did you know today we have medicines, we have chemicals that I could inject you if you're as white as my shirt and you could be as dark as my shoes in less than an hour? Because it would make the production of the melanin in your skin go seismic. <laughs> It's all about efficiency and it's all about the biology. And depending upon how efficient your factories work, that's where the skin color comes from. And I was at that meeting in Ashburn, Georgia, getting ready to preach, and a young man sitting about right here was being very arrogant. And I don't remember how I said it, but I knew I had this slide. And I said, okay, young man, if you're so smart and you want to get up here and give the lecture, tell me how those twins can be born to those parents. Because <laughs> those are twins. But they're different colors. It's real biology. That's all it is. And yet we have so many people in our world today that are absolutely ignorant, including people in the medical field, including nurses in operating rooms. Because two of these couples one in the previous picture, and this couple here, when they gave birth to their children, the nurses said to them, oh, your husband couldn't be the father. This child is the wrong color. Imagine how she felt. Imagine how he felt. And you see, this whole idea of racism has creeped into so many people's minds, and they don't understand real biology, and it's so sad. So sad indeed. The differences we see in skin color do not translate into widespread biological differences that are unique to groups. Not at all. The genes, the genetic information that explain the phenotopic differences between populations only represent a tiny part of our genome, confirming once again the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. Yes, we have different features. Yes, some group of people have, a, have a, uh, a feature that is continued on because it's been a mutation in their culture for years. They have an extra fold of fat in their eye. We call them from an oriental descent. They're just as human as you are. Where did you ever get the idea they're not human? This man here, both of these men served in the war together, George Wilson and uh, Bill Cabora. One was able to give a kidney to his friend because he needed it. Why? Because they were a biological match. So what happens? Well, we have man getting off the ark, and there he is in the Middle East, and now he starts spreading out the Tower of Babel. This is where it gets interesting to me because the same thing that happens to the dogs with their length of hair, the same thing happens to man. Because man starts spreading out across the globe, and man is going to be influenced by his surroundings just like everybody else. So now you have a man who goes north with his wife and they have very dark skin and they get up in a snowy region. What happens to them? They don't get sunlight and they don't get enough vitamin D and they develop rickets and they develop arthritis and now they can't hunt and now they can't plant and now they can't make a living and then they get abandoned by communities and by societies and they're living in caves and they die in the caves. And you've heard of some of these people. They're called Neanderthals. They're just as human as you are. 
but they had very dark skin, and that's how they developed those things, and that's what happened in their societies. You ever wonder why you don't see many dark-skinned people living in the northern and the southern hemispheres? It's natural selection and adaptation. Why? It's harder for them to live. Do you see a lot of really light-skinned people living in the equator? No. Why? Because if I go down there and I don't have a jacket on and I'm not covered up, the sin, uh, the sin, <laughs> the sun, <laughs> is gonna, the sun's going to cause sin in my body, amen? And it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to affect my skin, and I'm going to get cancer, and I'm going to die, and all my genetic information is going to die with me. But the man who has dark skin, lots of melanin, he gets that vitamin D from the sun, and he's really healthy, and he survives real well. And that's why we have people that have a lot of dark colored skin along the equator in the 30th parallels. And then north and south, we have light, light colored skin people living. It's normal biology. It's normal biology. And the Bible tells us our family tree started with Adam and Eve. They had sons and daughters. It came down through a bottleneck in genetic information through Noah and his family. And then from the Tower of Babel, cultures were created because languages came into existence. And when that happened, we saw more of a rapid change in their genetic information. And they went out all across the face of the earth. And now we look at DNA. And now we start taking samples from all around the world, including people that have been dead for 300 years and what do we learn we learn that the genetic information goes all the way back to a man and a woman that lived in the Middle East and evolution says oh man evolved from apes over here and over here and over here the Bible says this is what happened in the history of the world why don't you trust it it's his word I will praise thee, Lord. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are his works. And that my soul knoweth right well. And it's so sad when you travel through the towns and the malls of this area around Charlotte and you see so many people that are in darkness in this whole issue of racism because they don't understand the real history of the world. And you have an opportunity that God might use you to take them from where they are and lead them to Christ likeness. The blindness on this issue is everywhere in the world. It's just as strong over in Singapore and Indonesia and the Philippines as it is here. Because people have been lied to about the real history of the world and about real biology. And we as believers, we can educate ourselves. We can begin to teach them about the world that we live in. We can teach them using our biblical glasses on all sorts of things. But it all starts with our worldview. And it all starts with your worldview when it comes to the Word of God. You see, there's only two options. Either you're going to believe in secular humanism, the evolutionary tree of life, or you're going to understand there's a biblical account. And what you believe about where you came from affects your view of world history. And it affects how you live today. There's a biblical worldview. There's a secular worldview. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Who sets the rules? If Adam is in your past, then God sets the rules. If ape is in your past, you're going to make up your own rules because you're going to try to determine truth for yourself. What have we been talking about these last four days? What we see in God's world agrees with what we read in God's word. It's all about the authority of the word of God, friends. It is. And we need to have confidence in it because it is the word of God. And we can trust it. We just have to stop turning the TV, we have to start turning the TV off and turning our attention to the Word of God. As my preacher friend Dan said in one of the schools over in the Philippines, it's about time we turn off Facebook and get our faces in the book. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And we need to do that. Why? Because how we spend our time really reveals what we say we are when we're a Christian, when we say, I believe. Well, I'm here to try to challenge you. If you believe, then get into the Word. And let God change your life. 
and let him let you, you can change those in the Jerusalem you're in. You can influence your wife or your husband for the glory of God. You can influence your son and your daughter or your grandson or granddaughter or your aunt or your in-laws or your neighbors. Just love them. Just love them. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love thy neighbors thyself. And when you start loving them, maybe God will unlock that opportunity to say, Hey, you ever thought, boy, you've got some beautiful plants you planted over there in your garden. Have you ever thought about the biology that's in those plants? Start teaching them about the real history of the world. Start laying that foundation so that they won't be like Nicodemus. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Oh, Nicodemus, if I told you earthly things and you believe not, how are you going to believe if I tell you the heavenly things? Hey, what does it take for me to get right with God? It just takes the right conditions. Amen? And we need to learn how to teach people the right conditions. I put these slides in here. Most of you know them. The Romans Road. Hey, one man, sin entered into the world. Death passed upon men for all have sinned. Why? Because it's the real history of the world. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? Because of the real history of the world. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. A promise based on what? The real history of the world. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whoso believeth upon him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto him that call upon him. And guess what? We look at your DNA, and what does it do? It echoes that verse right there. We are all human beings created for the glory of God. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I hope this year you will share that verse with someone. Because Christians, what we're not doing today is we're not opening our mouths and we're not talking to people. You mean, Brother Tilton, you'll do it in Walmart? Yep. You'll do it in Kroger? Yep. You'll do it at the drive through at Chick-fil-A that you go to 20 times a week? Yep. Why? Because it's true. And they need to know the truth. Why? Because God loved the world. He gave his only begotten son, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus didn't understand what was coming. We cannot be saved apart from the history of the world. I hope this seminar has encouraged you and strengthened you. Thank you for your patience and staying a little longer tonight. But I felt it was important that we covered the information of God's word in a totality. Remember to take some of these tracks on the way out. Pastor, why don't you come and conclude our time we've had together. I'll stay as long as you want if you have any questions you'd like to ask me. Thank you, Pastor.